Titanic Talk with Nelson Aspen and Alexandra Boyd. Here we feature stories from the independent documentary Ship of Dreams Titanic Movie Diaries and everything else to do with the iconic ship. From James Cameron's epic groundbreaking movie to the history and legacy of Titanic herself. Join us and our special guests as we continue the 25th anniversary celebrations of Titanic. This is your first class ticket to everything aboard the Ship of Dreams. I'm Nelson Aspen and we're back with another episode of Titanic Talk and uh, Alexandra Boyd, the filmmaker behind Ship of Dreams Titanic Movie Diaries. Uh, I've been really looking forward to this today. You know, you you, you don't often get a chance to uh, to have reunions with friends of many years before, but that's what is in store for us today. It's very exciting because we we have this idea to to create a podcast, and it just keeps connecting us back to all these people from the past, and obviously new people who are coming to us, all connected to the ship of dreams. Who are we talking to today, Nelson? Introducing. Uh, this is a gentleman I met, I, I think by my calculations, it was 16 or 17 years ago, Michael Martin from Cove, Ireland, who long before, uh, you know, there were there were museums in Belfast, there was the Titanic Trail. Uh, and Michael not only created the Titanic Trail, he leads visitors and uh, uh, enthusiasts of the, of the story of Titanic and Lusitania on the these marvelous tours in Cove, formerly known as uh, as Queens uh, Queen, Queenstown. Queenstown. Michael, welcome to Titanic Talk, old friend. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to see you after all these years. And I have to say to the listeners, he looks just as good now as he did back then. <laughs> I don't know what a secret is, but he looks great. Great well, to see you again. Thank thank goodness your email address never changed and I was able to track you down. But but now Titanic Trail has taken on a, a huge life of its own. Uh, you know, even even almost two decades ago when I when I came and did it, uh, you know, it, it was it was a lark. But now you're still going, I'm assuming, bigger than ever. And what's what's a special treat for Alexandra, I, I, I will venture to say, is in her documentary, uh, Ship of Dreams, Titanic Movie Diaries, I talk about my connection to Milton uh, Long uh, from, uh, you know, maybe a past life, but I also talk about the adventure of going to Cove and we use clips of the Titanic Trail in her documentary. So it's it's your part of the Ship of Dreams family too. Uh, so it's very special, but tell us the origins of Titanic Trail, when it began and how you started it. Okay, well, um, I spent 23 years in the Navy, um, you know, prior to my coming out into civilian streets and doing this, that and the other. And there was one evening when we were on the naval base sitting around board, we heard about this chap who was giving a Titanic talk in the nearby town of Cove. Uh, so we went ashore to have a look and see. And I surmised after five minutes, I said, that guy was never on a ship in his life. He has <laughs> no, yeah, he might have. So uh, a little bit later, I was in Boston, Massachusetts, and I was doing the Boston Freedom Trail there and stood outside Constitution House. And I said to myself, this is the real place. You know, it's not a movie set or a reconstruction. Uh, this is where they actually signed uh, the Constitution. So I thought to myself, well, in Cove, it's the actual place where the last Titanic passengers embarked and also where seven lucky passengers disembarked and one crew member and I said the buildings are still there oh my god many people had known for many years that Titanic had called what was formerly called Queenstown but there was no means of interpretation so visitors would come they'd kind of look around didn't know what they were looking at so I decided to set up a guided walking tour uh, that would visit the places that are still all there the railway station where all 123 arrived in the cove is still there. The building, the doors that they walk through are still there. So my vision for the Titanic Trail was that we would take people in the footsteps of the passengers, seeing the same things that they saw all those years ago. And you mentioned earlier on, long before the others, I tease all the museums and say, I was the first Titanic tourism attraction in the world because we established this on the 8th of July, 1998 uh, was when we, we did our first walking tour. And that day, present on the day, was 
our beautiful but since departed Melvina Dean. Uh, she was there. Wow. Um, Ralph White, who has since departed, was there. He was the first photographer that went down working for National Geographic uh, with Robert Ballard. And this was on the first man dive to the ship as she lies sadly on the seabed. He brought the first images to us. So he was there. Another gentleman called Rory Golden was there on the day. And Rory subsequently was one of those uh, who went on an expedition down to the seabed. And very kindly, I had a plaque, a brass plate made uh, that says on it, um, commemorating all those lost on RMS Titanic from the people of Cove. I put Queenstown in brackets because it was Queenstown mm. then and Ireland. And I put a beautiful, I'm not a religious person, um, Nelson. If I said I was, you would be struck by three bolts of lightning before we finish. <laughs> I'm go there. But I wanted, noting it as a place of rest, the place of respect, I wanted to put a little kind of a prayer. And I found a very old one. A good friend of mine is a great speaker of the Irish language. And he told me about this little prayer. It reads, Gatuga on dia suvna siri on amokta. And in English, that means, may your God gather your soul into heaven. So it doesn't distinguish between Catholic or Protestant or Muslim or Buddhism. I just thought, and due to the... Um, the assistance from Rory Golden, the first Irish man to ever go down there, uh, we placed this back respectfully on the bridge of the ship and it's still there. And uh, there's some of the things that happened along the way. But as you say, on a daily basis, every day, we have people fascinated. This morning, for example, uh, we had 47 people in on a huge cruise ship who all came along. And it's the same thing. They cry at times, they laugh at times. They can't believe no, is that the original dock? Yes, that's the dock. Uh, this is the building. That's the church that they went to. So it's been really exciting for me. And I have to say, we established it in 1998. I still get great pleasure. I did two of the tours myself today, despite the fact we have 10 guides and multiple tours every day. Uh, I still like to get in there. Well, do... you're the captain of that ship, no <laughs> yeah. doubt. And and Alexandra can speak to this because, of course, she was uh, in the film Titanic, 1997, celebrating its 25th anniversary. So you're coming up uh, on your 25th anniversary as well. Tell what did the film do for your business? As a, you know, I was a Titanic well, enthusiast before the film, but what did it do for yeah, your business? Yeah, well, really, I always had an abiding interest in shipping and uh, because I was in the Navy, I suppose. But what it did for our business, like, I mean, I could have called our business, you know, the Cove Historical Walking Tour or the Cove uh, Boring Trapes Around, listen to a history lesson. <laughs> but I called it the Titanic Trail because uh, this film captured the imagination of the entire world. And what a pleasure it is for me to sit in the same company of Alexander, who was in that movie, because that movie, Alexander, I have to say to you, sustained us with a successful business over 24 years. You helped pay my mortgage and feed my children. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, oh, And that is uh, something to be said. And we keep coming back to this. And I tried to explore it in the documentary. Like, why? There's a big question mark over everything the actors who took part you know none of us knew we all thought the production was going to sink like the ship that it was going to be an incredible flop you know and uh, james cameron was out of his mind spending all that money on on one film which had never been done before and it was a shock and a fantastic surprise to all of us at the time that it that it really did capture everybody's hearts and minds. And now 25 years later, young people who weren't even born when the film came out encounter the film and they are drawn in by the story. So it's just, it's, it's something to the legacy of Titanic herself and James Cameron's ability to, to make that incredible film. And, it, and the film itself, it's like a historical event. We all remember where we were when certain historical events took place. But Michael, tell me about your memories of when Titanic came out. There you were in, in, in Ireland. Where, where did you first see the movie? Was, it at the, was everyone in town excited to see it? Do you have a, did you feel a sense of, uh, of patriotic pride because of your connection uh, in the locale to the, to the ship itself? Yes, well, there was a, a gentleman there at the time called Vincent Keeney, a lovely man, and um, he had um, 
come up with some great ideas about building a restaurant and uh, you know he won a small amount of money on a lottery he built a restaurant and him and I when this film you know came out I was already doing the tour and he was setting this up but we hired a big limousine and we went up to the premiere <laughs> show in Cork City and we brought a lot of guests with us I brought loads of copies of um uh, Father Brown's Titanic album. Uh, I was running a little bookstore at the time as well. Uh, so it was a big fanfare. It was an excuse for everybody to dress up. Um, and it was really exciting because not long after the movie was made, uh, in which Alexandra uh, starred, um, A&E TV commissioned 20th Century Fox to do a documentary called Beyond Titanic. And they came to me in Cove. Uh, so that was a news item in itself. Oh my God, 20th Century Fox coming to Cove and they were filming the Titanic trail and speaking to me about that. So it was a really, really exciting time. And I just felt we are the luckiest location in the world because Southampton, uh, there's been many, many changes there. New York, uh, the pier, dilapidated and so on. Um, Halifax, there's only the little pier where they were, you know, um, now that the graveyards are there and so on. But I just felt we had an entire location um, and was very proud of that and very proud then to be able to interpret for people. I mean, people's eyes widen every day. It's I don't know anybody else who's in the same job 25 years on and I still get excited going down meeting with people. And it is and a beautiful place. It, I mean, it's, it's so a, picturesque to have yeah. the to have all that history in such a beautiful location is, is really something. And I, I should explain to our audience, I was working for an Irish television show at the time. So I was filming all of this as a segment. And we 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 you and I, you took me to the point on the land where you would be able to last see Titanic before she disappeared. And, you know, I sort of like waved to my former self from that position. And then we got into a, a, a boat and we went out to that same point where Titanic would have last been able to see land. And I was able to wave back to myself. And, you know, it's just one of those extraordinary things for me. And I've had a very exciting career over the decades of, of, of globe trotting and celebrity interviewing and experiences. But the Titanic trail has to be one of my top 10 professional experiences that I've enjoyed over the years. And I think that resonated to my dear friend, Alexandra, because she used a clip of that segment uh, in Titanic Movie Diaries, uh, Ship of Dreams, which is, you know, it's so special and you can you can find it on YouTube, but there, but there it is, uh, a little uh, time capsule of ours. Uh, where do people, obviously you had people come from as far away as Los Angeles, which is where I was living at the time, but where, tell me about your clientele and where they come from. They come from all over the world. Um, this morning, for example, I had a group. There were people on the group. There was 45 people in the group. There were people from the Philippines, from Canada, from the United States, uh, from Great Britain, uh, from Germany. Um, and there was two people from Puerto Rico, uh, just all over the world. And at one stage, I had a little board up and I put a, a, a little national flag for every um nationality that it came into the tour i couldn't do it anymore yeah the, too full wall wouldn't have been enough <laughs> so they come from all over the world and of course because i was one of the earliest uh attractions as it were i have a very special website address it's just titanic.ie nothing else titanic.ie and I'm sure it's the envy of, because in Ireland, you can't just grab a domain name like .com. Yeah. You have to prove a legitimate association with the name. So I got that domain name many years ago, Titanic.ie, and people just book it online. We have two public tours that go every day, all year, except Christmas Day. It's the only day we don't operate. Uh, we have tour coach companies bring people in. We have ships bring people to us. Um, it's just been wonderful. And... The great joy of it, I mean, apart from it earning a living for us, is the joy you get with meeting people and their enthusiasm. Uh, Alexandra talked a moment ago about a new generation. This really happened last week. A mother got on. She said her 10-year-old daughters and her are coming to Cove. They're devastated. They won't make the walk that we had on. 
and they wanted to do uh, look at a virtual program that I'd done. I said, look, I've difficulties finding that now. I'll leave a DVD there for you. And if you can find something to play it on. I, so I left that gift for that child, a DVD. I left a little copy of that book, a little badge. Well, my God, um, they came. I was in London, uh, but they came to Cove, got it. And the little girl had left me this beautiful handmade card Thank you so much for the Titanic DVD. So this child is 10, Alexandra, just 10. And she's infectious about Titanic. It's just extraordinary. And I don't think anybody's been able to explain that. No, I, I, no, no, I've given up. <laughs> I've given up <laughs> trying to explain. And you've made a whole movie about it. Yes, <laughs> the, the, I, because the mystery I, of it. I thought, you know, that's what you do as a storyteller. You delve in and you unpick and you put it all back together again. And you have this beautiful tapestry of... Mm of of thoughts and and anecdotes and stories personal stories which is what you get when the actors read their diaries and you know just the actors revisiting the experience they had and the emotions that were were naturally came to them when they imagined what this terrible tragedy what experiencing this terrible tragedy must have been when you do a play there's a sort of there's a conceit, there's an understanding between the audience and the actors that this is slightly made up. We we know this isn't a real situation, but when you're making a movie and you're making a movie about a historical event that's incredibly important, it's incredibly important to get it right. So those actors really experienced it because the, the set and the, the setup was so was so realistic. Um, and it, it was very easy or it was it just ha it, they could not remove themselves from the horror of what those those poor people must have experienced. Yeah. And even in my own imagination, I go further. I'm like, well, we've in the film, we only see people on the deck or in the, the, the lifeboats. But what happened to the people who were trapped inside and the water coming and drowning and or or being trapped in an air pocket? I just. I, 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 my mind really fills itself with horror. So I have to come back up to the surface again and just go, you know, that's one of the reasons I think we just, people watch that film and go, they count their blessings that they didn't lose a child or they weren't trapped and not able to, to get out. And I was going to say that Michael, the, um, the Titanic is not the only uh, ship tragedy that is included in your tours. Uh, can, tell us about that. Yes, um, the tour, although it's called the Titanic Trail, what we try and do is we give a big overview of the entire harbour because it's a legitimate question to say, this is a small town. What was Titanic doing here at all? You know, um, why was this place so important? So we give a, an historical overview of the harbour, how it came to, to be as it was, a major stopping off point for transatlantic shipping. And then we go and visit various places. But another great tragedy that's associated with the uh, with the port, uh, and there are many, was the sinking of the Lusitania. And I've written a book about the Lusitania, actually, um, because one of the things I did after I left the Navy, Nelson, was I went back to college as a mature student, a very mature student. <laughs> I did a degree in history and I went on to do a PhD. Um, so I did part of my PhD in the University of California at Berkeley, and I have found an excuse every year to go back there. But along the way, um, I suppose I gained the skills and experience for research, um, uh, added with my enthusiasm, added with my 23 years in the Navy. So I just have different perspectives sometimes on these vessels. And one of them was the Lusitania. It had such a huge impact on Cove. And there's a beautiful memorial in the town centre that we stop at. We also stop at the Titanic Memorial at the former White Star Line office. But we like to give people a rounded view of the ship. And I often say to people, in many respects, she was predominantly an emigrant ship. There were so many dreams of coming to get a better life and live in a better place uh, aboard that ship when she was there. And I think one of the things that makes it so enduring, the story, is that all life was there. You know, there was love, there was hatred, there was efficiency, there was incompetence, uh, there was wonderfully kind and brave people, there were some cowardly people. I think that's what attracts us to it. Every element of life was in that ship that night. Yeah, a microcosm so of the whole world. Yes. yes, it was, really. And what we try and do is we try and contextualise its visit 
So we talk about the emigrants that uh, came to Cove. And even over the years, we extended our tours. We do a tour in Cork now as well, called the Cork City Ramble. But one of them that was very popular with groups, that still is very popular with groups of six or more, is we meet people in Cork City and we take them on the same railway line and we narrate them down to Cove. From Cork to Cove is only 24 minutes and we say, you see that castle out the window? The Titanic passengers that came down here on the 10th of April 1912 looked out and saw the same castle. This little bridge we're crossing over, it was here. That little dock over there. So it's about bringing the whole thing to life and we contextualize everything. Uh, a lot of the visitor, the, the passengers were emigrating, uh, trying to find a new and better life. Some of them had come back to bring, you know, the wonderful success that they had achieved in America. They were bringing their sisters back, you know. Um, there's so many stories like that on the ship and we try and bring people through the physical environment that those people stay in. When we say, Remember that beautiful haunting music in the film Titanic, the Illon Pipes? We tell people, well, the story began with a man called Eugene Daly who survived the Titanic and he played the Illon Pipes. And in this mm. building beside us, folks, on the night before he left, he played a tune. Somebody heard him out on the ship's deck the next day who had heard him and I said, will you play something for us leaving the harbour? So he plays, and this beautiful haunting music that you know, Alexander, from the film that you two announced. Um, that story began, if you like, in a little place that was a hotel in Cove. So this is what we do with our people when they come. It's about bringing it to life and put it into context. I have a great story about Brian Walsh, who plays those pipes in the film. Mm -hmm. he, uh, film, I love the way you say film. And he, he was a plumber. He was Irish. And he was a plumber living in Santa Monica, and he was- Well, he wouldn't know about pipes then. <laughs> <laughs> nice. He, he was part of Gaelic Storm. So they were all, you know, hired to play the music in the third class dance scene. And we all remember it. They, they are musicians, they're not actors, they are musicians. And Brian was a plumber. And mm. they married him off to Linda Kearns, who's in my documentary. She's the Irish woman. And of course, Brian, who was Irish, was the Irish man. So he kept, he keeps popping up in the film, not just as the Ilan pipe player in the band. He used to play, bring those pipes into the bar at the, um, at the hotel where we were all staying, and he would play them for us. And we felt like we were just on the ship, but he kept getting, his, his boss kept threatening to fire him because he had to, he'd go back to Santa Monica and then they'd be like, right, Brian, we need you back. We need, we need you in another scene. Everybody has these stories. We need you back. And his boss was like, you are, he almost lost his job. I don't, I don't know yeah. if he had a job to go back to when, um, when, when it was finished. And I really tried to find him for the documentary because he wrote a diary for me, mm -hmm. but I, he's, he's disappeared. He's disappeared. Yeah. Somewhere. I don't know if he went back to Ireland and retired. Yes. Well, maybe maybe he'll uh, tune into this episode of Titanic Talk. I mean, we, we just keep finding uh, new friends, old friends, case in point. Uh, and Michael, you mentioned uh, on the train ride and seeing the castle that had been there uh, since mm -hmm. Titanic days. And I think this is one of the most marvelous things that I discovered in, in my trips to Ireland. And I I remember and I still I still talk about it in, in terms of Dublin. There's there's so much. Uh, is preserved. Of, of, of all the places I've visited, uh, certainly in Europe, uh, so much is preserved. That, uh, and so contemporary can live alongside almost ancient, if you want to call it ancient. Yeah. And th there's that wonderful marriage between old and new. Tell me about your city's ability to preserve. How, how has everything uh, been able to be protected? Well, and it has, and we're very thankful that it has, but in Ireland, there's legislation that protects, uh, you know, culturally valuable buildings. So in effect, the entire, you know, seafront of Cove is protected. And it's amazing. Just this morning, I said to a group, I said, you know, on the 10th of April, walking up the street that we're walking up in 1912, those railings beside you, they were there. And, you know, they, they're making this connection. So they're preserved by legislation. And the legislation protects them. If you want to change them in any way, you have to seek permission. And we're really lucky that it's there because uh, in other parts of Ireland, what happened with Cove was that up until 
the early 1960s, it thrived even when the economy was slow because if emigration was high, coal was booming and so on. In 1962, when the first transatlantic flight took place across the Atlantic Ocean, it was a very, very rapid decline for shipping uh, as passengers, you know. Um, so passenger ships began to deplete, the numbers dropped off. Everybody, instead of spending six days at sea, they were doing 18 hours in a plane and getting to where they wanted to go. So our economy died very rapidly. When the rest of the country, the economy started to boom. Uh, and in other parts of Ireland, not all of them, but in some of them, they were tearing down old buildings and putting up new monstrosities. We kind of missed that because we weren't on the economic wave that everybody else was on. So when we come out the other side, we have this beautifully preserved town, the Cathedral on the Hill from 1860. Mm. Oh, my God. The White Star Line. And listening to you, Michael, though, it seems to me that you are an enormous factor in all of this preservation. That, you know, if you hadn't made a landmark of the Titanic Trail and people, that's the thing they do when they come to Cove is 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 look at all these places where the, the, the Titanic passengers last stood on Irish soil. If you hadn't set up another piece of that story there wouldn't be so much connection to it and there wouldn't be so much care in in, in these in these buildings and these walkways that are still yeah. exist dr martin <laughs> you saved the town <laughs> i have i have been a pain in the ass the people in the past about <laughs> preservation complaining about you gotta do this you gotta do that but i have to as well compliment you know the the people in the town like when i set up the walking tour uh the titanic trail initially um, I wanted to get bronze plates made so that if people came into Cove and they didn't make the tour or couldn't, didn't want to do it or whatever. So I got 17 phosphor bronze plaques made. Now, phosphor bronze is a material that you'll find on all ships. It's usually used on deck fittings because it's impervious to salt or rust or anything like that. So I wanted a plaque to mark the Titanic Trail stops. They cost a fortune. They were something like £400 each in 1997. I wanted 17 of them. I didn't have that kind of money. But the townspeople came and spawned. You know, I got I got 50% of a government grant heritage agency um, who were happy to support it. But the local townspeople, the local hotel, the Commodore Hotel, the Queenstown Story Heritage Centre, even the bishop, put his hand in his pocket to help sponsor one of these plaques. So there is a joint effort and there's credit to go to people. But I have to say, yes, uh, have I been passionate about it? Have I been pushing? Have I been highlighting the value and the beauty of coal for 25 years? Yes, I have. I'm guilty as charged. I'm afraid. God bless you. Now tell <laughs> folks who might not be, be familiar with that part of the world, uh, in, what's the easiest way to, to visit you? How, how do we negotiate our way to get to, to get to Cove. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm saying Cove, which in English sounds like C-O-V-E. It's actually C-O-B-H, because that's the first thing you need to know. Don't go Googling for C-O-V. <laughs> it's C-O-B-H. The Irish sound V is given by B-H or M-H. So, so Cove is in County Cork on the south coast of Ireland. Um, but we are probably the most accessible town in Ireland. We have an airport, Cork Airport, just 20 minutes from Cove. We have a cruise terminal um, where ships can dock right beside us or you can come in on a yacht. We have a railway line that comes right into the centre of town. And we have um, a national road network system that's much improved since you were here, say, even over 16 years. Um, so Cove is easy, accessible to get to. A lot of people will kind of fly into Dublin or Shannon or even London. You can get a plane to Cork, you can get a train to Cork. It's very, very accessible. Um, we operate every day. So don't ever worry. Well, we're not going to November. The Titanic Trail is operating in November. You just get on our website and book us and we'll be there. And so wrap it's very up warm, accessible. I imagine. Wrap up warm, but the wind whips around there in November off the coast. Yeah, but I've been to the pub. It's a nice place to get warm. That's the solution <laughs> to the wind. You've got it in warm. That's the solution. We have Atlantic storms coming over, but you get yourself into a little pub with a nice fire and an Irish coffee and you know, you forget about that. Yes, right. we, we have a funny relationship with rain and weather in Ireland. We're obsessed with the weather. We'll never really concede it's rain unless it's horizontal and accompanied by gale force winds. <laughs> Other than that, 
uh, it is it's mist or it's a soft day and it's a, you know that's the way we approach it but yes um, the weather varies enormously of course but I have to tell you the last 10 days folks I've been swimming in the sea uh, every day for the last 10 days it's so warm here at the moment very unusual well, we certainly know it's warm from the hospitality, that is for sure. Te meeting you uh, all those years ago and experiencing the Titanic Trail, as I said, was a, was a professional and personal highlight for me. And I hope our listeners will put honor. Uh, a visit. I hope, I hope it's on everybody uh, who's listening. I hope it's on their Titanic bucket list because it should be. So we're so grateful to you. Uh, hopefully we're going to get back there and hopefully oh, we will see you in, uh, in one city. About it, haven't other. we, Nelson? We've talked about it. Yeah, so, we have. We have. We have discussed uh, Cove as a place to uh, to come. Maybe show the documentary. Uh, get get a bunch of other Titaniacs together and uh, and celebrate together. How, isn't the expression to have a crack? Have a great bit of crack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's it. That's and it. it's spelled C R A I C. And it means as opposed to plumber's crack, which is the <laughs> piper. There's a, that's a different kind of full crack. Circle. <laughs> <laughs> Full circle. Michael, thank you so much for being a guest. Uh, we're, we couldn't be more delighted to, to reconnect. It's been such thank an honor. So thank much. you so much. And do please come. Yes. Do please come. Yes. Yeah. We'd yes. love to see you. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review. And if you'd like to hear more podcasts like this, hit the subscribe button. For information on where you can see Ship of Dreams, Titanic Movie Diaries, go to shipofdreamsfilm.com. Titanic Talk is a production of Ship of Dreams Film Limited. At Titanic Talk, Nelson and I are looking for the ultimate superfans. Do you have a passion for James Cameron's Titanic or any of the other screen adaptations? Are you an amateur historian with a vast knowledge of the ship herself? We would love to invite you on our podcast. Come and talk Titanic with us and all things aboard the Ship of Dreams. To reach out, email info at shipofdreamsfilm.com. We look forward to hearing from you.